This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, a brief history. The Howard family, headed by the Duke of Norfolk, were one of the most powerful Tudor dynasties. They were known for their ambition, wealth, arrogance, and ability to bounce back from scandal. On this episode of A Brief History, we look at Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, and the son of Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk. On the 19th of January, 1547, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, was executed on Tower Hill. He was the last person executed for treason in Henry VIII's reign. But who was he, and how did he cause the fall of the Howards? Born in 1517, Henry Howard was the son of Thomas Howard, then the Earl of Surrey, and Elizabeth Stafford, daughter of the Duke of Buckingham. On his mother's side, he could trace his ancestry back to John of Gaunt and Thomas of Woodstock, both sons of Edward III. On his father's side, he could trace his ancestry via the Mowbray family, back to two children of Edward I, Thomas of Brothington and Elizabeth. Henry spent much of his early childhood at Kenning Hall, Lambeth, and Hunston Hall in Hertfordshire, with one year spent in Ireland when his father was Lord Lieutenant. He received a humanist education, including rhetoric, moral philosophy, the scriptures, and translation of classical authors. Alongside this, he learned European languages, etiquette, and, once he was old enough, martial skills. In 1524, his father succeeded to the Dukedom of Norfolk. From that time, Henry used the title Earl of Surrey. However, this was only a courtesy title. The earldom still belonged to his father, and Henry remained a commoner. Norfolk's ambitions for his son were high. After Wolsey's fall, he was given care of Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, and he sent Surrey to be a companion to Fitzroy, the young Duke of Richmond. Between 1530 and 1532, the boys were both in residence at Windsor and enjoyed a close friendship. Norfolk had hoped to secure the Princess Mary as wife for Surrey, but Anne Boleyn turned against the scheme. Instead, Surrey married Frances de Vere, who was the daughter of the Earl of Oxford in 1532. Due to their age, they did not immediately live together. In October 1532, Surrey and Fitzroy traveled with Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn to Calais for their meeting with King Francis I. During the visit, the two kings signed a treaty of alliance, and to guarantee Henry's promises, Fitzroy and Surrey remained in France. They spent the winter in Paris before traveling to Fontainebleau in the spring of 1533 and accompanying the royal progress to Provence in the summer. The exposure to Renaissance art, architecture, and poetry was crucial to Surrey's cultural education and development. Over his lifetime, he spent well beyond his means on art, architecture, and furnishings, including sitting for multiple portraits and building an imposing mansion outside of Norwich. On the return to England in the autumn, Fitzroy married Surrey's sister, Mary, and the two young men went their separate ways. Three years later, England descended into turmoil. 1536 is seen as a pivotal year for Henry VIII, but it was also a transformational time for Surrey. In May 1536, he was deputized by his father as Earl Marshal at the trials of his Boleyn cousins. Sir Thomas Wyatt, who Surrey much admired as a poet, was imprisoned. In July, his half-uncle, Lord Thomas Howard, was attainted for treason. Then five days later, Fitzroy died after a short illness. Surrey was grief-stricken at his friend's death, and would remain so for at least a year. In October 1536, Surrey had his first military experience, accompanying his father north to deal with the Pilgrimage of Grace. Norfolk's initial conciliation towards the rebels raised suspicions about his loyalties, and both Norfolk and Surrey 
were dogged by rumors that they were rebel sympathizers. When there were new outbreaks of rebellion in the spring of 1537, Norfolk took harsher action, assisted by Surrey. However, summoning Surrey to help him raised fresh problems for Norfolk, as he had done so without royal permission. Worse, though, was rebel nobleman Lord Darcy making new claims of Howard sympathies for the rebel cause. Surrey returned to Kenninghall in the summer of 1537, where he grew very weak, a state that his father claimed he was in whenever he thought of Fitzroy. In August, Surrey returned to royal court, where an unknown person accused or insulted him, and he responded by striking them. Surrey was confined in Windsor Castle as punishment for disturbing the peace. During this time, he wrote an elegy expressing his despair at his loss of freedom. He also came to resent the new men at royal court, blaming them for his imprisonment. Going forwards, he would be known for his haughty air of superiority, extreme pride, and ready defense of his honor and of true nobility. He was released by early October 1537 and kept a relatively low profile for the next year. However, he did dine with Edward Seymour and his wife Anne, prompting hopes that he might commit to an evangelical cause. He was more prominent in 1539, attending court regularly and continuing to dine with the Seymours. In 1540, the fortunes of the Howard family as a whole improved. Thomas Cromwell was executed, and Henry VIII married Catherine Howard. Her relatives benefited from her advancement, including Surrey, who was appointed to the Order of the Garter in 1541. However, by the end of the year, Catherine was in prison, and she was executed on the 11th of February, 1542. It's around this time that Surrey wrote one of his angriest poems, in it, he attacks a she-wolf, generally believed to be Anne Seymour, for refusing to dance with Surrey, depicted as a lion. This turns into a broader attack on the wolf who is vicious, fawning, and drinks the blood of those who have yielded in contrast with the honorable lion whose relatives have been persecuted. Surrey continues to display an angry, reckless streak. In July 1542, he was imprisoned in the fleet following some quarrel with John Lay. Again, the details are murky. He was released to accompany his father on a military expedition against Scotland before returning to London, where he lodged with Mistress Millicent Arundel. On the 21st of January 1543, he and his friends shocked the residents of London by running wild through the city, smashing the windows of houses and churches, and harassing prostitutes. His actions were not investigated until after he broke the Lenten fast. Then it was discovered that servants of Mistress Arundel's house had gossiped whether Surrey was a prince, even going so far as to suggest Surrey would be king if anything happened to Henry and Prince Edward. Nothing came of these claims at the time, but Surrey was sent to the fleet for his riotous behavior. There followed a concerted effort to divert Surrey's attention to military action. In October 1543, Henry VIII joined the English army assisting Charles V in northern France. The following summer, he oversaw the logistics of the failed campaign to capture Montreux, in August 1545, he was sent to France to defend Boulogne and was appointed lieutenant general on land and sea for England overseas possessions. He acquitted himself well over the Ottoman winter, maintaining supply lines, extending fortifications, and keeping the French at bay. If anything, he did too good of a job for the councillors in England. They felt that Surrey was taking too many risks and would have preferred Henry VIII to abandon the expensive campaign in favor of peace. On the 7th of January, 1546, Surrey launched a disastrous ambush on a French supply column at St. Etienne. 
After some initial success, his troops fled, and Surrey was unable to rally them to return to fight. He was demoted in favor of Edward Seymour and returned to England in disgrace. England in 1546 was a mass of simmering tensions. Henry VIII's health was deteriorating, and he was becoming even more irritable and short-tempered. It was clear that he was going to die, while Prince Edward was still a minor, and everyone was jostling to secure their positions. Politics combined with religious tensions as conservatives such as Bishop Gardner sought to prevent a regency sympathetic to Protestantism by implicating Queen Catherine Parr as a heretic. To protect the Howard interest, the Duke of Norfolk proposed that Henry Fitzroy's widow, Mary Howard, should marry Thomas Seymour. However, his efforts were undermined by Surrey. Over the course of the year, Surrey declared to a friend that Norfolk should be regent if the king died, wrote a letter to John Dudley that concerned him enough to forward it to the king, and told his sister that she should become Henry VIII's mistress in order to manipulate the king to the benefit of her family and friends. The exact cause of Surrey's arrest on the 2nd of December is unclear, but it seems to have been based on evidence from Richard Southwell. Surrey was held at Ely Place until the 12th of December, when he and his father were taken to the tower. Because he was a commoner, Surrey was not taken by barge, but instead had to walk under the armed escort through the streets of London. Four days later, the imperial ambassador was told that the Howards had planned to kill the council and control Prince Edward. Over the next few weeks, Surrey, his family, and servants were interrogated, and commissions traveled into Norfolk to look for evidence of treason. Rumors of their crimes ran rampant through the court, even saying that Norfolk and Surrey had planned to kill the king and his heir. In the end, there was one charge brought against Surrey. That on the 7th of October, 1546, he had displayed the arms of Edward the Confessor with three silver labels at Kenninghall, arms that were reserved for Prince Edward. In usurping the royal arms, he threatened the succession, which was treasonable. However, the heraldic charge against Surrey is not clear-cut. In the 14th century, Richard II had given Thomas Mulberry, Duke of Norfolk, the right to use the arms of Thomas Brotherton and the right to bear the arms of Edward the Confessor. When Surrey's grandfather was created Duke of Norfolk in 1514, he was deemed to have the precedence from 1397. The implication was that the Howards had the same rights as Thomas Mowbray. Indeed, the arms of Brunlington could be found in the coat of arms used by Surrey's father and grandfather. They do not, however, appear to have used the Confessor's arms. Surrey's folly lay not in recognizing the dangers of prominently using the royal arms at such a politically tense time. He added to this by claiming Edward the Confessor had personally given his ancestors the right to bear them, suggesting a direct link to the last Anglo-Saxon king. Combined with his comments about the Howards being the best choice for the regency, and his suggestion for his sister to become the royal mistress, it was easy for the enemies of the Howards to suggest that Surrey had kingly ambitions. Surrey was tried as a commoner at the Guild Hall on the 13th of January in front of a jury of gentlemen from Norfolk. He pleaded not guilty and defended himself for eight hours. The jury's deliberations took a couple of hours suggesting some dissent, but ultimately Surrey was found guilty and sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Henry VIII commuted this to beheading, and Surrey was executed on the 19th of January. There remained the question of Norfolk. He had already offered up all his lands to the king in an attempt to save his life. Then the day before Surrey's trial, he confessed to revealing state secrets, using Brotherington's arms and his coat of arms without authority, and concealing Surrey's treasonous use of the confessor's arms. 
He was condemned to death by an act of attainder, passed on the 27th of January. However, Henry VIII died the following day. The council didn't want to start Edward VI's reign with bloodshed, and so Norfolk remained in the tower until the accession of Mary I. Surrey's legacy lived on his poems and translations, and in the new poetical forms that he had invented. These included the form of sonnet commonly known as Shakespearean sonnet, and English blank verse invented when Surrey translated two books of the Aeneidad. His work paved the way for future poets and dramatists. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.